National Oil Program. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Murder on Rourke Island. murder on Rourke Island had a curious beginning. There was no hatred in Keith Brandon's mind, no anger, no malice. In the beginning, there was only relief and freedom and love for a girl named Kathy Dunn. As each small private club, he could see her across the floor standing near the piano the blue light working magic on the white satin of her evening gown. He smiled as he walked toward her. And so Hello, I Kathy. Above, I'm waiting for the man Aren't you, aren't you glad to see me? Please, Keith. Not now. What kind of welcome is this? We settled everything a year ago. Now, if you don't mind... Wait a minute. You've got to let me talk to you. There's nothing to talk about. Kathy. They're all watching us. Where's your dressing room? Please, Keith. I tell you, I've got to talk to you. That's all there is to it. If you want it in the middle of the floor, it's all right with me. Oh, all right, Keith. Go ahead. Now, you've got something to tell me. I suppose your father's changed his mind, put the seal of approval on nightclub singers. Haven't changed a bit, have you? The old friendly approach. Well, let me tell you something first. You had a choice to make between me and your father, and you made it. As far as I'm concerned, it stands. You're pretty bitter, aren't you? I think I've a right to be. Kathy, I told you then that I loved you. Well, I always would. I meant it. Sure. Until father put his half-million-dollar estate up against me. <sighs> It was different after that, wasn't it? Me or the money. Didn't take you long to decide. You through? Go right ahead. Father died last night. That's why I'm here. You're... You're free now? Yeah. I want you, Kathy. I love you. I wish I could believe Oh, Kathy. Please. Please, Keith, let me think. You know you love me, Kathy. Tell me. Oh, I... I do, Keith, darling. I do. It was worth waiting for, after all, wasn't it, Keith? The dominating, smothering influence of your father... His insistence that you live under his roof and eat at his table. That you jump every time he cracked the $500,000 whip he held over your head. For that long, terrible year after you made your decision to see it through to the end. But it was worth it. And they're both yours now, Kathy and the money. Or rather, the money and Kathy. 
Because you know in your heart that the money will always come first. There's a wonderful feeling of freedom inside you as you drive up the tree-lined drive of your Uncle Matt's estate the next morning. It seems there was something about the will. Uncle Matt? Oh, Keith, my boy. I'm glad you're on time. This is Mr. Bradbury, your father's lawyer, executor of the estate. Hi. How do you do? Sit down, Keith. Thanks. Mr. Bradbury and I have been talking over your father's will. Doesn't it seem a little soon? 24 hours. That's the way he wanted it. 24 hours? What do you mean? It was part of his arrangement with me that the provisions of the will go into effect 24 hours after his death. The probate will come later, of course. That's why I called you in this morning, you see. I wonder why I didn't say anything to me about it. There are a lot of things he didn't talk to you about, Keith. What, for instance? His estate, for one thing. Now, wait a minute. You're not telling me... That was a change. No, no change. He promised me that when he died, I'd... Relax, Keith. The estate is yours. All right, then. Suppose we get it over with. There must be some papers to sign Just stuff a and... minute. The estate is yours, Keith. But it's your father's request that I hold it in trust for you. What kind of double talk is that? Now, take it easy, Mr. Listen, Bradley. Uncle... You Madden, better let me finish, Keith. According to the will, I am to hold the estate in trust. But there'll be monthly allotments to you out of the income. And you'll be eligible to receive them as long as... Go on. As long as you live with me under this roof. He can't do this to me. He's dead. That money's mine. Wait a minute, Keith. He tortured me, kept me prisoner in this house for years. He can't do it anymore. You hear? He's dead. He can't reach up out of his grave. Get a hold of yourself. I don't care. I don't care. Sorry, I had to slap you, Keith. I just had to do it. Sit down. Uncle Matt. Sit down, I said. Now, whether you're aware of it or not, your father was very fond of you. He felt you still need someone to look out for you. I agree with him. I'm of age. I can take care of myself. You're a highly emotional young man, Keith. Not as stable as you might be. What do you mean, not stable? You did attempt suicide once over a girl. Oh, what? I was a kid in high school. Well, maybe so. I remember it seemed pretty important to your father at the time. So I do a crazy thing in high school, and he decides I need a guardian for the rest of my life. Why are you trying to make excuses for him, Matt? You know what's behind it all as well as I do. He was a bitter, selfish old man who had to have things his own way even after he was dead. Well, this isn't getting us anywhere, Keith. Let's get the thing settled. Nothing I can do, then? Tell him, Bradbury. The will takes effect tonight, Mr. Brandon. According to its terms, you must live with your uncle six days out of every week. Suppose I refuse. The estate goes to the public hospital fund. I see. How long does this go on? As long as your uncle is alive. After that, I guess you're on your own. Mr. Bradbury, there's nothing in there about marriage, is there? What do you mean? Just a minute, Matt. Mr. Bradbury, supposing I decide to get married and bring my bride here to live, would I be fulfilling the terms of the will? You're not considering marriage, Keith. Answer my question, Mr. Bradbury. Why, no. There's nothing that would prevent it. Great. How'd you like to have another steady border, Uncle Matt? Who is it? Kathy Dunn. You broke up with her a year ago. I saw her last night. We're going to be married. When? Tomorrow, maybe. Any objections? You... You know how your father felt I about don't that. think that makes any difference now. Nice of the old boy to leave me a loophole. Suppose I refuse to allow her to come here. What about that, Mr. Bradbury? I'm afraid you can't, Matt. He has a legal right to marry and live with his wife. If you refuse to let her come here, you're preventing him from complying with the terms of the will. I see. Uncle Matt, you'd better set an extra place for dinner. I'm bringing Kathy with me. Well, Keith, you're feeling a little better as you drive away from the house toward Kathy's apartment on the other side of town. You're on top now. For the first time since the whole maddening thing started 15 months ago. When your father suddenly decided he wanted you with him for the rest of his life. From then on, nothing made sense. There were no explanations, no reasons for anything. He knew when the cards were down, you'd do anything for that half million. And he was right, wasn't he? You walk up to Kathy's doorway a half hour later. Hoping she'll understand. 
Hello, Keith. How are you, darling? All right, I guess. Something wrong? No, I guess not. I just talked with Uncle Matt. It's, uh, it's not quite the way I told you last night. He was appointed trustee of the estate, and I'm going to have to live at the Cedars. I know. Huh? I've just talked to your uncle on the phone. What, what did he call you about? To tell me about the will. He had no right to call you. I'm glad he did. You, you belong there with him, Keith. What do you mean? Please don't make it hard for me, dear. I, I've decided not to marry oh, him. Oh, wait a minute. He didn't tell you everything. We're going to be married. You're coming there with me to live. There's no way he can stop it. Don't you see? I love you, Kathy. I want you there with please, me. Please, please, Keith. I, I've made up my mind. I'm not going to change it. That's all. What else did he say? Tell me, Kathy. Nothing. Nothing What else. made you change, then? You wanted to marry me last night. What made you change your mind? Keith, there was please. something else. He told you something else, some vicious, underhanded lie. Oh, no, Keith. I'll kill him. That's what I'll do. I'll kill him. Keith. Sorry I said that, Kathy. You'd better go now. Yeah. I guess you're right. Um, Kathy. Yes, Keith? Don't... Don't tell anyone what I just said, will you? Of course not. I'm sorry I said that. I said I'd kill him. With the prologue of Murder on Rourke Island, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale... By the Whistler. Just think, by the time next week's Whistler rolls around, it'll be 1947, and your car will be another year older. More than ever, it's going to need the more conscientious service that cars get at dealer-owned signal service stations. And when I say more conscientious, let me show you what I mean. When signal dealers lubricate your car, for instance, they don't take chances on memory. No, sir. Instead, they check against Signal's factory-recommended lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point on your car. And they use nine specialized Signal oils and greases, so each part will have the exact type of protection it needs for long, trouble-free service. But do they stop there? No, sir. Just to make doubly sure not a single part has been overlooked, they check each point again, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. Now, that's the kind of lube service you want when today's aging cars have to last until there are enough new ones to go around. And that's the kind of lubrication you get from your friendly, dealer-owned signal service station. And now, back to the whistler. climax that morning in Kathy's apartment. All the hatred, the frustration, the rage against the idiotic demands of your father welled up inside you and exploded in a single remark. I said I'd kill him. And though you don't know it, the elements are all there and a pattern is beginning to take shape for the murder on Rourke Island. Your life in prison is beginning all over again with Uncle Matt as the jailer instead of your father. Six days out of every seven, Keith. You're free to come and go as you wish, but six days out of every seven, you must live with Uncle Matt at the Cedars. <sighs> there you are, Keith. Thanks. Uh, I thought you'd like this room best. Nice view of Lake Washington out of the window here. Yeah, great hardly contain myself. We want you to be happy here. Is that in the will, too? What? Does it say I have to be happy? You don't have to stay here, Keith. You're of age. You can leave any time you want to. Let's not get into that again. Selling my soul for a half a million dollars, and I know it. You leave me alone? Of course. We'll have dinner at six. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, 
And so it begins again, Keith. And during the weeks that follow, your life falls into a rigid pattern. Breakfast at eight, dinner at six, evenings in the library with Uncle Matt poring over his stamp collection. And you know it will last as long as he lives. That only his death can bring you at last to the thing you've suffered for. Before long, you realize the will to murder is somewhere inside you. But it's not until a night in early spring that it finally crystallizes into a plan. In many ways, it was like all the other nights. You and Uncle Matt in the library, the dull novel, the stamp collection. Oh, that halfpenny black. If I wasn't such a tight what was that? Uh, just saying, if I wasn't such a tight wad, I'd buy that halfpenny black. Stamp dealer in town's got a fine used copy, but he wants $40 for it. Oh. Kind of quiet tonight. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised if we had a little rain when the wind's from the southwest. Rain, rain sure, sure to follow. To follow. <laughs> Do I always say that? Every night at 8.55. You never miss. Going to bed? I got a headache. Any aspirin upstairs? Ought to be some in the medicine cabinet. Oh, thanks. I'll take a look. But there isn't any aspirin in your medicine chest, so you try the one in Uncle Matt's bathroom. Find the aspirin on the lower shelf. Start to close the cabinet door. When your eye lights on a bottle, a prescription bottle, half hidden by the others. Your hand shakes as you pick it up, examine it closely. And it's at that precise moment that all the elements come together to form the plan for a murder three months in the future on a tiny tree-covered dot in the middle of Puget Sound called Rock Island. You are not much interested in your breakfast the next morning. Ah, these darn strikes. Wonder where it'll all end up. Excuse me, Uncle Matt. What's the matter? Aren't you going to finish your breakfast? I'm not very hungry. Uh, I thought I'd run down to the library. Do you mind? The library? Yeah, I heard about a book the other day, and <laughs> I... I'm sure. Go ahead. Just bowled me over, I guess. The public library is the last place in the world I'd expect to find you. Yes, I, I know I haven't a card, but... I don't want to take the book out. I, I just want to look at it here. What was the title again? Materia Medica. It's a textbook on drugs. Now that's a very interesting question. I, I don't mean to be stupid, Doctor, but... Oh, not at all. The drug is habit-forming, then. Oh, more than that. To a victim of certain forms of heart disease, it's like eating or breathing. It's the difference between life and death. How often do they take it? Oh, once a day, usually. And if they stopped? Heart failure, of course. How soon? Two days, possibly more. It depends. Well, thanks very much, Doctor. Oh, forget it. Always glad to help out a detective story writer. <laughs> you know, I'm quite a mystery fan myself. That's our number. I just wanted to double check. I probably filled that prescription myself. What did the card say? Mm. First filled February 14th. Dr. Talbot. For patient, Matthew Brandon. I see. That's all except for the name of the prescription, of course. Extract of Digitalis. <laughs> Hello, Uncle Matt. Well, you must have done a lot of reading. Been gone all day. Oh, I had a few other things to do. Oh? Yeah, you, uh... You know what today is? Saturday. April 16th. Big day, isn't it? Keith, how did you know? Never forget a birthday. Here. An envelope? Be careful how you open that. Yes. Yeah, let's see. Why, well, it's empty, isn't it? Look down in the corner there. Oh... A halfpenny black. That's right. Stance you've been wanting. Okay. I, uh... I don't know what to say, Keith. Let me say it, will you? I 
took a long walk today, Uncle Matt. I did a lot of thinking about you and me. I've been awfully wrong. I want things to be different now. I really believe you mean that, Chief. I do. Don't worry, boy. I... I always thought you had a great heart. Things will be different now. Yes, Keith, things will be different now. And you didn't lie to him. You did take a walk, and you did do a lot of thinking about how you were going to kill him this summer on Rourke Island murder him with a perfect, ingenious plan that had no possible chance of going wrong. The first thing, of course, is to get his confidence. And as spring changes into summer, you develop an interest in his stamp collection, go for walks with him along the lake, spend evenings together at the theater. And finally, on the day in early June, you decide he's ready. Uh, just look at the lake out there. You know, as long as I've lived here, I never tire of it. I don't think I could ever live away from water. You know, it, it makes me think of the summers you and Father and I used to spend on Rourke Island. I haven't been there for years. We still own it, don't we? Yes. The lodge is still there. Wharf, the dory. I suppose so. Well, let's go. Huh? Just you and I. We could do a little fishing, loaf around. Do you really want to? Well, of course I do. Look, you need a change, too. We could hire a boat to take us out there, bring bring food with us, and spend a week or ten days. Why, George, I... What about it? It's a deal. Three days later, as you stand on the jetty on Rourke Island and watch the boat moving out into the sound on its way back to Seattle, you realize that there's no way you can fail now. By the time the boat returns, Uncle Matt will be dead of heart failure. And at long last, the legacy will be yours. The doctor told you he couldn't last two days without digitalis. Nine should make it certain. After dinner, it seems an eternity before Matt yawns and finally suggests going to bed. You lie there, tense, until almost midnight. He's sound asleep now, breathing heavily as you quietly get out of bed and slip on your clothes. First, the small boat moored down at the jetty. Now this rope. There. That ought to do it. You cut it loose. Stand there a minute, watching it drift out with the tide. Then you hurry back to the house. On the kitchen table is the portable radio telephone Matt brought along as a safety measure. You take out the rectifier tube, walk quietly to the rear of the house where he can't hear. But the most important thing of all is the bottle of digitalis you'd seen him slip into his luggage when he thought you weren't looking. You carefully feel through the suitcase at the foot of his bed. Take it out. Make certain it's all he has. And then walk to the sink. You empty it. You fill it with water from the faucet. Five minutes later, it's back in place in the suitcase. There's nothing to do now but wait. <laughs> you like your eggs, Keith? Up easy. Right. Uh, got the table set? Where are the plates? They're on the stove, getting warm. Ah, smell that, boy? Nothing like the smell of bacon and eggs, is there? Yeah. Let me help you dish up. Take care of the coffee, will you? You know, Keith? Yeah? We're going to have a great time together from now on, aren't we? What's the matter? Nothing. Let's sit down to breakfast, huh? The 
The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Tomorrow being New Year's Eve, most programs tonight are wishing you Happy New Year. And of course, we want to do the same. But just wishing doesn't always make a thing come true. That's why the Signal Oil Organization has asked me to go a step farther tonight and leave a thought with you which, if it saves just one life, will be well worth this moment of your time. New Year's Eve is one of the most hazardous nights of the year for drivers and pedestrians. Many people are at the wheel who shouldn't be. Cars are old, driving conditions are not good. If you don't absolutely have to go out, don't. But if you must drive, take it easy. Keep the speed down. Keep a sharp eye on other drivers and pedestrians. I know these are somber words for an occasion like this, but if all you friends of the Whistler will just remember them tomorrow night, it'll go a long way toward keeping some unnecessary auto accident from marring the Happy New Year, which we of the Signal Organization hope will be yours. And now, back to the Whistler. <laughs> Well, Keith, it's a little unusual to be sitting down to breakfast with a man you know is going to die in a day or two. Yes, it's all done now, isn't it? Your only chance of getting away from Roark Island vanished when you cut the boat adrift down at the dock and smashed the rectifier tube of the radio telephone Uncle Matt brought along for safety reasons. Yes, the murder has been committed already, hasn't it, Keith? It happened the moment you emptied his bottle of digitalis down the sink and refilled it with plain water. He might last 48 hours, but it's a good nine days until the boat comes back from the mainland, and you know it'll happen long before then. Halfway through breakfast, you look up from your plate to see him watching you, a quiet smile on his face. Your father never would have believed you could eat like that. <laughs> you know, Keith, you're a different boy now than the one he knew. Is that good or bad? It's wonderful. I'm going to do something I promised him I'd never do. I won't be with you forever. I think you can take it now. What do you mean? He was afraid you'd kill yourself if you ever found out about it. That's why he was so unreasonable about your staying home. Why he refused to let you marry. That's why he wanted me to take care of you. What are you talking about? See this? Did you tell us? I'm going to let you take care of it now. Matt. You'd better develop a lot of respect for it, Keith. You've been getting it secretly in your coffee for two years now. It's the only thing in the world that's keeping you alive. <laughs> Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, who have asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure in 1947, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. You'll go farther and have a happier new year. Featured in tonight's story were David Ellis and Charles Seal. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>